Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, a show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. Thanks for being with us today. I'm your host, Ivana, and my guest today is Dr. Jake Hebert, ICR research scientist and physicist. I'm so glad you're here with us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So today we wanted to talk about the universe and whether or not it's young or old. Um, The universe is massive when we think about that. It's massive. It contains everything we see and even more that we can't see. Um, Is that right? Am I on the right track? Yeah, I I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we think about the universe and from secular astronomers, they give an estimated age of the universe and that's about 13.8 billion years. And that's really old. So how did they arrive at that number? Okay, that number, that estimated age for the universe Mm -hmm. is coming straight from the Big Bang. Because they think that's basically, if you run the numbers backwards, that's how long it takes to bring everything together. Not not necessarily to a point, but to a, their very small volume when mm-hmm. the Big Bang was starting. So it's, it, you know, of course, if the Big Bang's not correct, that number is completely wrong. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with reality. And so I don't I don't think it has anything to do with reality, but that's where they're getting it. It's coming. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not even coming from radioisotope dating. It's coming from the Big Bang. Okay, so yeah. they're just running it back. Running the numbers and coming backwards, up that's that. right. That's but it's right. not like cutting a tree open and being nope. able to physically Mm-mm. count. Okay, yeah, yeah. interesting. So for us, you know, we believe that the universe is much younger. We're creation science fans. And as creationists, um, how would you? How old would you say the universe is and why? Well, I'd, I'd say it's 6,000 years old because okay. that's what scripture says. And, you know, I think what, what's the best way to date something? Uh, The absolute best way to date something is by reliable eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. You know, if you stop and really think about it, if your parents had not told you when you were born or if you did not have a birth certificate, Mm -hmm. you could have trouble estimating your own age, let alone somebody else's age or the age of a rock. Mm -hmm. Um, And so really, people, I think, are too overly impressed by these dating methods because they involve math and they all seem kind of sciencey and people... Mm -hmm. But but what's really important is the assumptions behind them. And if those assumptions are wrong, you can't trust those age estimates. And every age ass- 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 assessment or assignment that they come up with, mm-hmm. without exception, has assumptions built into it. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's not possible to do that without making assumptions. Mm-hmm. So if you have a reliable eyewitness who can tell you the age of something, that's the absolute best way to date it. And of mm-hmm. course... When, with scripture, that's what we're claiming we have, okay? Mm-hmm. That God is the ultimate reliable eyewitness. He never lies. He never let, makes any mistakes. And he's telling us mm-hmm. that he created the universe recently. Now, it is true the Bible doesn't say, you know, God created the universe right. X number of years ago. Yeah. But if you add those numbers up in the genealogies, you get an age of about 6,000 years mm-hmm. for the earth and for the universe. And so... I would say it's it's about 6,000 years old based on Scripture, primarily. Yes. Okay, that makes sense with the timeline presented in the Bible. And we're looking at the Bible in one sense, but do we have the astronomical evidence for that? Uh, There is. There is evidence, especially, I I think evidence of youth is especially strong on Earth and within our solar system. Okay. Um, now remember, all of these ages uh, um, assignments, you ha- you can't do them without making assumptions. And, mm-hmm. and creationists, we have, we've done age assessments as well. Mm-hmm. But what we do is we take the evolutionist assumptions. Okay, mm-hmm. we ma- we make the most generous assumptions to their position that we can, okay. and we run the numbers and show that the evolutionary story contradicts itself. And we do that a lot. That's a that's a very common thing that we creationists have done. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, you can make very strong arguments that the Earth's magnetic field cannot be billions of years old. In fact, even secular scientists admit they don't know how the Earth's magnetic field could last for billions of years. Right. Not only that, however, there's strong evidence it can't even be 100,000 years old. Okay, so you see indications of youth on Earth and within our solar system mm-hmm. uh, that are particularly strong. Uh, Comets look young. Uh, you know, there was there was a particular comet, Comet Hartley 2, that is outgassing CO2, carbon dioxide gas. Mm-hmm. And the secular scientists were shocked because this thing is supposed to be billions of years old. Why is it still right. outgassing CO2? They, they were just completely shocked by that. But if it's only a few thousands of years old, that makes a lot more sense. So especially within our solar system and on Earth, I think we've got really strong evidence uh, for youth. 
Now, when you get out in a deeper space, mm -hmm. it's a little more equivocal because to be fair, there's some arguments that they make that you can see how somebody could argue for an old universe. Distant starlight is the classic example. Okay. But you know, the thing is, it's, it's, um, it's not as simple as everybody thinks it is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I said that whenever you make an age calculation, you have to make assumptions. Mm -hmm. It's even worse when you go out into deep space because you have to make even more assumptions than normal. And, and even something like the distant starlight argument, which at first seems to be a very strong argument that the universe has to be billions of years old. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you've got g distant galaxies that are, are billions of light years away, and we don't dispute those distances. We think those distances are correct. Okay. They really are billions of light years away. Shouldn't it take billions of years for that light to reach us? Uh, well, we don't think that's necessarily the case. And it, it's, you know, and I think relativity theory, Einstein's theory of relativity, I think goes a long way uh, to explaining that apparent paradox. Um, and we've got, we've got explanations out there for this. Now, mm -hmm. in fact, at the 2018 International Conference on Creationism, there were some papers presented, and one of the panelists on the panel about dealing with distant starlight mm -hmm. said he thinks we've already solved the problem in principle. Uh, now, I don't, I don't, do we have the specific solution yet? I'm not sure that we do because there's other things just besides distant starlight we need to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think as far as just that issue in and of itself, I think creationists have pretty much answered that. Uh, but I think there's some other things that we also, we also need to explain. So I'm not sure that we've got that particular solution yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, but it's not as simple as everybody thinks it is. And you know, an example I like to use is everybody remembers the uh, Cosmos reboot on Fox. Uh, you know where, and of course, if you watch that series, you know they were taking pot shots at creationists all over the place. But there was one episode they had called "A Sky Full of Ghosts," and it was about distant starlight. Okay. And and the in the in the in the show, they're making this big deal about how. All our common sense ideas about light and time and distance are all wrong because of relativity theory. And of course, they're right. That's true. But then what do they do? Well, they make this common sense argument based on distant star like that recent creation can't be right. Well, wait, you just, you just said that all our common sense ideas are wrong. Maybe there's a little bit more to this than you're, than you're uh, assuming. Mm -hmm. And it, I, can, I can assure people it's not as simple as everybody thinks it is. Um, but, you know, the thing is, deep space objects are problematic for both creationists and evolutionists, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. They have to make assumptions, too. And there are things about, for instance, distant galaxies that seem to be contradicting the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Re remember that they think that these that uh, the most distant galaxies, uh, by their reckoning, they were formed shortly after the Big Bang. That's what they think. So they think that, that we're seeing those distant galaxies not as they are today, mm -hmm. but as they were a few hundred million years right. after the Big Bang. Well, if that's the case, and, it, and if it's also true that that distant starlight takes billions of years to reach us, we ought to be seeing those distant galaxies not as they are now, but as they were shortly after the Big Bang. Therefore, they should look very immature, unevolved. Okay. But guess what? That, that expectation is routinely contradicted. Mm. And what that tells me is that there's either something wrong with the assumption that distant starlight takes billions of years to reach us, or there's something wrong about their ideas about galaxy evolution, mm. or maybe both. So, you know, it's not a slam dunk for them either. There are, there are things in deep space that present problems for them as well. Mm. But I think, I think the preponderance of evidence, especially when you're looking here on Earth and in the solar system, mm -hmm. where incidentally, we have the greatest amount of knowledge. Okay, we've sent <laughs> space probes to all these yeah. planets. We've, we've got all this data. We've never been in deep space. Nobody has. Okay, mm -hmm. evolutionists haven't, creationists haven't. So we're all having to make assumptions about what it's like out in deep space. But here, where we've got the most data, the most understanding, the evidence for youth, I think, is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, um, I, I can only, I can only think of maybe one argument uh, for an old solar system that is fairly convincing, and I can think of a bunch that are pointing to youth. I, and, mm -hmm. and even the argument 
for them that sword of convincing is a double-edged sword because it also presents problems for them too. Mm. And I'm, I'm not talking about radioisotope dating. I'm I don't think radioisotope <laughs> dating is a good argument. Um, now there's some still some things we're working on mm -hmm. with radioisotope dating. You know, we think there was accelerated decay in the past, and and one obvious potential problem with that is that you get a lot of heat generated, and somehow you have to dissipate that heat safely. And we're still working on that. We don't we don't have that solved yet necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I think it's painfully obvious that radio radioisotope dating doesn't work because when you can test it on rocks of known age, you routinely get the wrong answer. Yeah. Or when you use multiple methods on a given rock, you get answers that disagree with each other. Mm -hmm. So I don't even consider radioisotope dating to be a good argument for mm -hmm. an old Earth or an old solar system. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I think you know, when you look at the solar system, it really does look young. It really does. I mean, practically everywhere you look, uh, you know, wh whether you're talking about the moon, mm -hmm. Jupiter, Saturn, the other planets, I mean, it really does look young. And, and I think that shows that we've got a little bit, as creationists, we have a little bit of an edge here. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a big edge, but we got a little bit of an edge okay. because where we have the most data and the best understanding, the evidence more strongly confirms recent creation than an old one. Yeah. So could you give us more explanation as to some of those arguments that show youth in deep space? Right. Uh, well, one example has to do with spiral galaxies. Uh, you know, they look, they call them spiral galaxies because right. that's what they look They're like. They spirals. look like these spirals. Got it. Now, those spiral galaxies are slowly rotating, but material mm -hmm. toward the center of the galaxy is spinning around the center faster the material that's farther out. Okay. And as a result of that, because you know, you've got different spin rates, what happens is the material closer to the center is spinning around faster and those spiral arms get wound up tighter and tighter and tighter. Okay. And so after really just maybe a few hundred million years, you know, you're gonna start to notice this and uh, eventually that spiral structure is going to be completely obliterated. You're not going to see it at all. You should really just have basically a featureless flat disk. Hmm. But we still see spiral galaxies mm -hmm. out there all over the place. Even our own Milky Way galaxy is a kind of sp a spiral galaxy. Now evolutionists, you know, to be fair, they, they know about this problem. They have something called a spiral density wave model. Uh, that they can claim can maintain the spiral, maintain the spiral structure for, for long ages, but even they admit that it's got problems, mm -hmm. and they've been working on it since the 1960s, and they're still working on it. So, uh, right now, the simplest explanation for that is that these galaxies are relatively young. Now, it doesn't tell you how young they are. Mm -hmm. uh, it just means they're a lot younger than what they're telling us, um, and so uh, that's one one example that's a very common example among creationists. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there's some things about globular clusters that have surprised evolutionists mm -hmm. uh, because they were expecting certain things because they were supposedly among the oldest objects in the universe. But there's some things about them that look kind of young. Um, and I really think creationists need to take a harder look at this. We haven't really talked about it that much. Uh, I, I can only think of one creationist technical paper that addressed um, this, this indicate one of those indications of youth in, in these globular. Well, actually, I never even told you what a globular cluster is. Yeah, okay. Tell me about well, it's, they're like snow globes in space. They're very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they orbit, they orbit galaxies. We have, oh, I guess maybe a hundred or 200 or so of these globular clusters orbiting our own Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. And when you see pictures of them, they look, they look like snow globes in space. Just this very dense collection of stars. Very beautiful. Uh, but there was there's there's a number of things about them that surprise mm -hmm. uh, that it surprised. I mean, they've said themselves that they were surprised because they were expecting certain things after billions of years, and those things weren't there. Okay. <laughs> so I think creationists probably need to spend a little more time on this. Yeah. I'm a little I'm a little surprised and maybe even disappointed mm -hmm. that we haven't dug into that a little bit more than we have. I think I think we we can probably. Um, do more with that argument than we have so far. Okay. Can you tell us about blue stars? Okay. Blue stars, uh, they, uh, they, they're very massive, and they burn through their nuclear fuel very quickly. Uh, and so the very hottest blue stars should use up their nuclear fuel in really just a few million years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course, that begs the question, why do we still have blue stars in a universe right. that is 13.8 billion years mm -hmm. old? Uh, we creationists would think it, would argue that it's because they're not that old. Right. 
Evolutionists would argue, well, you got new, new blue stars being formed to replace them. Okay, I mean, that's a possible explanation. Mm -hmm. And But, um, but uh, and like, to be fair, you know, there are some creationists who think maybe you could get star formation today. Like I said, I'm not sure I buy that. <laughs> and I'm not sure a lot of creationists buy that. But there are some mm -hmm. who think that could, could be the case. Um, so I guess it depends on whether you think those star formation scenarios are plausible or not. Uh, but if you don't, then that's another argument uh, that, that the universe is a lot younger than what they're telling us because uh, the, they can't survive for more than mm -hmm. a few million years tops. Yeah. Okay. Um, you went into a lot of different things, and I really appreciate you explaining you know, the difference between when we look in deep right. space mm -hmm. versus our own solar system. And right. So that's just really interesting. Um, I'm sure you could go on and on about just <laughs> right, yeah. different those different evidences within our planet or mm -hmm. our solar system. I would you know, love to hear more about that. And I'm sure our viewers and listeners would love to as well. But just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And of course, you can find our podcast on YouTube and anywhere else that you might find your normal podcast. If you have any other questions that you'd like to have answered, just send us a message on social media. And for, don't forget to rate us and review our show so that others can know more about us. And of course, subscribe for future episodes. But I'm Ivana, and thank you so much. We'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast. <laughs>